Chair of Communication and the Dean of Social Sciences, Dr. Lisa Dunbar. I have no comment after that, just saying I'm glad the pictures weren't up there, that helped a lot. Oh, there's a picture. No, oh, I spoke too soon, didn't I? Hope, said the poet Emily Dickinson, is the thing with feathers that perches on the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Do you remember your first day of college? Graduates, do you remember your first class? Do you remember that bewildering juxtaposition of hope and terror in your heart? I remember some of you, I remember your faces looking up at me, fear on your faces, wondering why a loving God would allow your first semester schedule to include a torturous class like public speaking. Some of you even came up to me after class and you told me that you might pass out, throw up, or even die if I required you to speak in public. It's true, you know it's true, but you didn't quit. You stepped up to the challenge. Do you remember the saying, like Helen Keller, if you were going to have butterflies in your stomach, you were going to get them to what? Fly in formation, that's right. Despite your anxiety, you were filled with hope for a new adventure. You faced your fear, you found your voice, and today you stand at the precipice of a new chapter in your life. It's a moment that's both exhilarating and terrifying, isn't it? Tomorrow morning, you'll process into the auditorium wearing a cap and gown, which is a symbol of your intellectual and spiritual accomplishments. But specifically tonight, I want to focus in on that cap for its rich symbolism. Graduation regalia is said to have originated back in the 12th century, where it was modeled after the garb of scholarly clergy. These early hats were marked by their color, pichros in the Greek, the word for red, the color of royalty. Red symbolized the lifeblood, the power over life and death, represented by royal rule. I'm guessing we're having some slide difficulties, so you're going to have to imagine everything I'm saying until I get those slides up there. And you've heard the saying that knowledge is power, right? <laughs> not that, oh, that, not that slide, Luke. That was a little bit later. Okay. Oh, my graduation garb, that's the one we're looking for right now. Okay. You've heard the saying that knowledge is power, and indeed, in the wrong hands, power can be manipulative, crushing, even deadly, right? But in the right hands, wielded in the right way, power can be culture-shaping, pace-setting, life-transforming, resurrecting, right? Romans 8.11 reminds us that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in us as believers. Today I want to give you a practical and spiritual application of the CAP, C-A-P. In grad school there's a saying, you don't get a PhD, you become a PhD. And in the same way, your journey at San Diego Christian has been transformative. Your education has been focused on the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. We didn't train you to become a stoic scholar who processes only with the intellect, smart but dispassionate. We trained you to think and analyze with the heart and to view the world and its issues through the lens of God and to act accordingly. So let's focus in on some lasting impacts of the cap, and I have that triple threat there. How many of you know who that picture is? About a third of the room, all right, awesome, yes. Uh, that's the triple threat, surely, yes, surely triple. Uh, that are, we're gonna focus in on three principles, C, A, P, C, the commitment to community, A, an attitude of altitude, and C, or P, sorry, I can spell, the pursuit of presence. I'm gonna unpack those for you. Let's look first at C, a commitment to community. 20 years ago, just yesterday, May 4th, I boarded a plane bound for Miami, from Miami, Florida to London, England, and on that flight, I penned these words in my teenage journal, I will never fall in love again. <laughs> Through a series of relational wounds and family abandonment, I had allowed a proverbial layer of ice to settle over my teenage heart. But little did I know that the God who ordained every day of my life had prepared for me to meet a young man on the very first day of that trip to England. And that man would melt the icy crust off my heart and become my husband, mullet and all. Mullet. We didn't call it a mullet back then, did we, parents? What did we call it? It wasn't a mullet until it was like past cool. 
I was so clouded by my past experiences that I almost missed the, God, the gift that God intended to give me, that gift of community. Neuroscientists tell us that the brain is literally wired for relationship. Dr. Siegel, who's a new, uh, neuroscientist at UCLA, says that the brain is genetically programmed to be social, hardwired to take in signals from the external environment to alter its own internal states. And if that sounds a little strange to you, consider the words of King Solomon in Proverbs 22, 24. He said, do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you will learn his ways and get yourself, what, ensnared, yes. Our social relationships are powerful influences. In his book, The Moral Molecule, Dr. Paul Zak shows that the bonding hormone, Dr. DePriest mentioned it earlier, oxytocin, impacts not only individual but collective relationships. In fact, he's found that a relationally warm society is actually a more financially prosperous society. Really interesting stuff. Psalm 68, 6, God tells us that he sets the lonely, yachid, in families, the solitary, the forsaken, the wretched. He puts us in the context of relationship for our healing. Many researchers have outlined the benefits of community. I've put a few up here on the slide that's right before this one. It has a whole bunch of them on there. Uh, but a Harvard study in 2010 actually found that a lack of healthy social connections is, is affiliated with depression, cognitive decline, increased morale, mortality. In fact, it found that having a lack of friends, a lack of healthy social connections, is the physiological equipment of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's unhealthy for us to live a relationally disconnected life. I like how Dr. Parker Palmer puts it in the next slide. He talks about how we, it's not just a metaphorical application. We literally wither and die without healthy social connections. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, your mind says, two are better than one. Pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Now, social media has both helped and hurt the process of relational development. On one hand, it can definitely serve as a relational reinforcement for existing relationships, and it can serve as a connective tie for distance friendships as well. But social media can also train us to become spectators who observe the lives of others, but we don't genuinely interact with them in a meaningful way. Maybe you've heard the term socializing. Have you heard that? Sofalizing? Are you sitting on your sofa and you're scrolling through your Instagram feed, hanging out with your friends, right? That's not a genuine, healthy social interaction. Okay, let's go. If you've been wounded in a relationship, as I have been prior to my England journey, it's easy to withdraw from relationships. I love this picture. It's from an old book, uh, Carl Rogers, A Way of Being, 1980s. But he has this image where he describes this forgotten sack of potatoes that are in his basement and they have these anemic offshoots kind of spiraling upward to the tiny basement window, and he calls them life's desperate attempts to become itself. Our own hurts can create those kinds of offshoots in our lives, and we have to allow the Lord to shine his light of truth and to snip off those dysfunctional anemic offshoots so that we can forgive and face our fears and enter into healthy relationship. I get it, it's not easy, Jesus gets it, he was well acquainted with sorrow, with betrayal, with the fickle crowd, right? But we have to resist that knee-jerk reaction to write people off or retaliate or close ourselves off from human relationships. We have to be intentional. Lone rangers get picked off by the enemy. Also, the kind of community you, you choose when you graduate will dramatically affect the kind of person you become. Proverbs 13, 20 says, whoever walks with the wise, what? grows wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Grads at SDC, you've had this instantaneous daily access to godly community. But once you leave here, you're gonna have to seek that out intentionally. You need to get plugged into a local church where you can give and you can receive. This is vital both for you as an individual and for the local church, capital C, as well. I don't know how many of you read Barna's 2016 State of the Church report, but even though 73% of Americans identify as Christian, a smaller and smaller minority are part of the local church every year. And when we look at the missing demographic today, it's millennials and Gen Zs, your generation and the one right above you. It's a, there's a sobering lack of involvement with the bride of Christ, and we need to fix that. So we've got to push past those hurts, those habits, those hang-ups in order to walk in authentic life-giving community, and we need to choose that community wisely. Second, in addition to being committed to community, 
Being an SCC grad means displaying an attitude of altitude. Let's unpack that one. As you move out into the world of work, you're going to experience times of plenty and times of lack. This is true in seasons of singleness and seasons of marriage. It's for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and sickness and in health. You've committed to community and now as an SDC grad, you wanna develop that attitude of altitude. There's aptitude, which is your natural propensity, ability towards something, and then there's altitude. It's at an extent or distance upward. It's a, a new vantage point. We used to focus on crystallized intelligence, and now we know that it's not just intelligence, but it's socio-emotional intelligence. It's much broader. We need that new lens for our altitude. The attitude which we approach, with which we approach our daily struggles and even our daily victories will set the pace for our future relationships and our future decisions. Our belief determines our behavior. We have to train our minds to see through the lens of truth, not the fleeting lens of emotion, because things are not always as they seem. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Isaiah 55, 9 says, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Sometimes what looks like the end is only the beginning. When Jesus' disciples stood at the foot of the cross, watching their king give his life as a ransom for many, the despair was palpable. They expected him to take over, to rule and to reign on their terms, and in that moment. But things aren't always what they seem. The disciples thought their king was dead and their dreams were over. But the father breathed life into the son and raised his body up from the grave. What looked like a tragic loss was indeed the setup for an unparalleled victory. Remember that? Five years ago this month, I felt those same pangs of anxiety. I had finished my PhD, I knew God had a plan for me, but every single door I expected to open was closing shut. I was feeling very uncertain about my future. And one afternoon, I was in the backyard in my, in my city, 538 miles away from here, and I was standing under this massive flowering mimosa tree. You see these beautiful trees? And I was asking slash whining to God, saying, where are you? Why are all these doors closing? I thought you had a plan for my life. And suddenly, I heard the sound of little tiny gunfire as the seed pods hanging from the tree started popping open one right after another. I froze in amazement as I heard these just popping, popping, popping all around me, their seeds scattering into the wind. And suddenly, inexplicably, I was filled with hope. I knew that through the seeming barrenness of my life, God was planting seeds in the unseen realm. He was preparing a place for me, not just metaphorically, but literally. Within three weeks, unexpected new doors had opened for me. I had a new job offer in hand from San Diego Christian College, the old had passed away and the new had come. You know, King Solomon told us in Proverbs 6, 6 to consider the ways of the ant and be wise, to observe and learn lessons from the natural realm. Graduates, allow space in your heart for God to speak to you through the circumstances of your life. Lean into him and trust him, even when you don't see his hand in motion. That's an attitude of altitude. And if you've never read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? This is a good time to add that to your summer reading list, just saying. The modern culture tells us to rely on our feelings for interpreting life, but this is not a biblical construct. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked and desperately sick in the NIV. In fact, David, when he was feeling down, what did he do? He spoke to his soul. In Psalm 42, 11, he said, why so downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him. Our emotions have a rightful place, but it's not as the CEO of our daily lives. In her work on mindset, Stanford University professor Dr. Carol Dweck says that many of us find ourselves getting stuck in what she calls a fixed mindset. That's my totally nerdy fan picture with Dr. Dweck. Such a nerd, I know. We limit ourselves to what we've experienced in the past and we stay stuck in that rut because we rule out the possibility of transformation, of metamorpho, of metamorphosis. We forget that as Ephesians 3.20 says that we serve a God who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. When we focus on that fixed possibility, we constrain ourselves to the limitations of a finite understanding instead of embracing what Dweck calls a growth mindset, a recognition that we can learn and grow and change throughout the entire lifespan. The fixed mindset causes us to become stagnated and frustrated. 
First Timothy 6, 6 says that godliness with contentment is great gain. Say that with me. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment, as Tarkaz, defined in this passage as sufficiency of the necessities of life. Listen to this part. A mind contented with its lot. It's an attitude of attitude. Contentment is a choice. The Greeks called the island Cyprus, Hemakaria, which is the, it means the happy isle. And Cyprus, they said, was such a rich and fertile island that they believed no one would ever go beyond its coastline to find the perfectly happy life. It had the perfect climate, abundant flowers, fruit, trees, natural resources, and it contained everything they needed for perfect happiness. This kind of sounds like America's finest city, huh? Right? San Diego? This root word, makarios, is the same word used in the Beatitudes to describe joy, that blissful state serene and self-contained, a happiness that is completely independent of the changes and challenges of life. Not happiness half, like happenstance, haphazard, chance, random, but a joy, a pervasive joy that can only be found in Christ. What looks like the end is often only the beginning. Trust the God of the universe when things look bleak. A seed must first die before it brings forth a new life. And finally, in addition to community and attitude, the CAP stands for presence, being fully present in the moment, interacting meaningfully and intentionally with those God places in our path. It's not enough just to be on the right track. Maybe you've heard the old saying by Roy Rogers, who said, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. We gotta move. Our presence determines our engagement. So how will you, graduates, how will you add to your realm of influence, the place where God plants you? It's very easy to get distracted today, to be pulled out of the present moment and away from our face-to-face -face relationships. The average American sees over 3,000 ads a day. Some media studies say up to 10,000 ads a day. We're constantly being distracted. A UC Irvine study says the typical office worker gets about 11 minutes of uninterrupted time in a span. And that same study says the typical students feel the need to check their social media accounts every two minutes, every two minutes, that's 10 times during this message. And the Journal of Media Education found this year that students often spend 20% of their time in class on their phones in non-class related activities, not you students, students at other universities, other schools, not you, not you guys. In fact, some social scientists believe that we're now addicted to distraction. And we often find ourselves living in the future or in the past or other relationships altogether instead of those face-to-face -face ones. You see it pictured there. We find ourselves in that situation, don't we? We can also get so distracted by the small details that we miss the big picture. In 2009, the San Jose Times ran a transcript of a 911 call and in that call, a caller was reporting that a mattress had fallen off of a truck and was flipping around dangerously on the highway and cars were dodging it right and left. Instead of connecting the caller to highway patrol, the dispatcher spent several precious minutes lecturing the driver on who she should have called and giving her, even going so far as to giving her the phone number while the person was actually driving. So the driver's last very frustrated words were, never mind, I'll just let someone get killed. And she hung up. And that's exactly what happened. Being in the moment means we keep our eyes on the big picture, not just the smaller details of our job description or momentary inconveniences. Staying in the moment also means that we don't allow the past to pollute our present. Dr. Dan Siegel, whom I mentioned earlier, tells a powerful story from his past. He's an accomplished neuroscientist, very educated person, but when he and his wife had their first child, he found himself having a very unnatural reaction. When the child cried, he felt angry. That's not the right reaction, right? What should you feel? Compassion, right? We should be moved to action, right? Good. But when the child would cry, he would get angry. So he talked through, talked with his friends, journaled. All of a sudden, he remembered that when he was in med school, he had to hold down crying babies in the middle of the night who had to get their blood taken, and he found himself sobbing. And the older doctor said to him, Siegel, if you're gonna get through this job, you gotta shut off all your emotions. That's exactly what he did. 2 Corinthians 6, 11 through 13, the Apostle Paul told the church in Corinth, we are not withholding our affection from you, but you are withholding your affection from us. He said, I speak to you as my children. Open wide your hearts. Can I tell you that the world we live in desperately needs our intentional affection, not just our quick comebacks. They need our hearts, not just our smarts. The world you're entering, grads, is broken and hurting 
When you look at the stats on homicide, you look at the stats on uh, even a, a new stat at UNC Chapel Hill on abortion by ethnicity, staggering, tragic details. STDs, 50% of 20 million per year in the 15 to 24 year old population. And even the stat that 85% of teens from Christian homes are walking away from the faith today. We desperately need to reproduce physically, spiritually, to multiply and disciple. The Greeks have this beautiful word for compassion, spaknitumai. Mm, sounds like a sneeze, spaknitumai. It literally means moved to the bowels. Now I know bowels and beautiful don't really go in the same sentence together, it's kind of weird, but the truth is that being in the present moment should motivate us to compassion. It should motivate us to action. Hope, said Eric Erickson, is an indispensable quality, something that we cannot allow to die no matter how much we've been wounded, how much our trust has been impaired. We must cling to that. So graduates, as you face this next adventure that is your life, Isaiah 43, 18 to 19 has words for you. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Let's allow him to do a new work in us so that we can be fully present with God and with man. I was very impacted by a story Francis Chan told years ago. He said that he asked his congregation how many sermons they'd ever heard. And the room exploded with excitement. Some people said hundreds. Others bragged thousands. And then he asked the simple question, how many people have you discipled, baptized? And the room was silent. It's not enough to have community or to have the right attitude. We need to put those constructs to work and become engaged in the culture right here, right now. We're called to truth, purpose, and impact. Jesus told us to go out into the world and to make disciples of all men. It's not enough to be aware of the issues facing us. It's not aware enough to think about them, not even enough to talk about them. What good is the power of knowledge if we don't use that knowledge for his good and for his glory? Remember that the right power in the right hands can change the world. Remember, too, that hope, the thing with feathers that perches on the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Remember to extend that hope out to those around you, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So graduates, as you don your royal cap tomorrow, your CAP, let's put on that commitment to community. Let's take up that attitude with altitude and let's live in the present moment with those within our realm of influence. Whatever career fields we're entering, let's live our lives in the spirit of truth, purpose, and impact so we can powerfully and positively change the world for his kingdom. God bless you.